Would you open your Bible to the 14th chapter of the book of John? John chapter 14. Tonight I want to talk about hot buttons. Have you ever heard the saying, boy, that guy pushed your buttons? You ever heard that saying? Now what does that generally mean? Somebody pushed your buttons. They know how to aggravate you. They know how to get under your skin. They know how to, to you know, uh, you know who's good at that? He was a wise boxer. It was Muhammad Ali. You know, people made fun of him because he just, he's running his mouth all the time. And uh, there was a reason for that. You see, if you're a boxer and you get your opponent mad at you, you could beat the tar out of him. Because a, a mad man, an angry man that's given himself over to anger is a man who has lost his cool. He's lost his control. That's true in wrestling too, isn't it? you got to keep a cool head. you got to be strategized. you got to keep it together. Oh, Ali, he could, he could get under their skin. You know, you see them when they come together for their promotion of their fight. You know, they, one is just trying to egg the other one on, just back and forth. Um, those are hot buttons. I want to talk tonight about the fact that you and I are hardwired to be hacked by our adversary. You and I. We are hardwired with vulnerabilities. You know, how many of you know what a, a, a firewall is on a computer? Antivirus programs and malware, anti-malware programs. These are designed to prevent somebody that doesn't belong in your computer electronically to stay out, it keeps them out. Literally like the word firewall implies. In the building of a, of a commercial building you have to have so many firewalls that divide up that building that keep zones separate from other zones. In case a fire breaks out, this will keep it from spreading to the other part. And so an electronic firewall is for the purpose of keeping something pernicious or malicious to spread into your safe computer. You and I don't have a natural firewall against the adversary. And I want to talk about that a little bit tonight. That's the downside of the subject. But what stirred this thinking in my heart was the good side of the subject. Listen to me carefully. We have an advocate that has no buttons to push. And our victory over our adversary, when we do spiritual warfare, when we get out there and we get ourselves clothed in the armor of God and we start catching every thought that comes our way, we snatch it down and we bring it into captivity under the obedience of Christ. And we have all these imaginations coming at us, polluting our way of thinking, discouraging us or enraging us or whatever they do. We cast them down. We have strongholds in our life because of sins that we've committed for years and years. And their paths so familiar that it's so easy to fall into that same stuff again. We can have this confidence that if we are in Christ and we allow Him to be in us in the fullness that He wants to be in us, we have a defense. And it's the fact that he has no buttons to push. Turn to John chapter 14. <clears throat> I'm going to start in verse 28. Just going to read through verse 31. I know, be afraid when the preacher chooses few verses. That doesn't mean he's going to be short. <clears throat> but I'm going to try because I'll probably run out of voice before you run out of hearing. At the end of John 28, and many, many ideas. If, if we were to take them and we could, we could spend an entire series of messages on just one sentence. 
because Jesus is saying a lot. His earthly ministry is coming to a close. He's trying to communicate important things to his disciples because he's not going to be there physically. So this is that conversation that he has with those men just before they leave the upper room. John 14, verse 28. You have heard how I said unto you, if I go away and come again unto you, There's not an if in there. Let me read that again. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away. I'm going, guys. And will come again unto you. I'm going to rise from the dead. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Now I told you before that it comes to pass, that when it is come to pass, that you might believe. Now that's... That's a good way to be. You know, you, you tell your children, honey, daddy's going to go take care of that snake. Daddy's going to be all right. I'll come back. And it inspires confidence when you go take care of the snake. When you come back, they, oh, okay, you know, my daddy knows his limits. He knows what he's able to do. I can trust him. When he says I can handle this, I can settle in and let him handle it. And that's what Jesus is saying to them. But now notice, <coughs> big transition here. He says, hereafter, I will not talk much with you. I mean, he's going he's gonna to talk with them on through chapter 15 and 16 and 17. But all of that could be said in, in an hour's time. He probably had two, three hours to be with them. And a lot of that was spent in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. But relatively speaking, saying, guys, I'm going to be occupied. I'm going to be busy. I'm not going to be with you. i got to go places you can't go. I'm not going to say much more to you. And this is the reason why. This is zero hour. What does he say? For the prince of this world comes. And you know, the prince of this world has already started his dirty work. He's already recruited Judas. Judas has already signed the deal. He's already gone and got the soldiers. He's going to be coming shortly. But notice these next words. Unusual words. The prince of this world is coming. Let me put it in good Georgia talk. But he ain't got nothing on me. And he has nothing in, that's the proper preposition, in me. I'm going to think, I'm going to talk a lot about that tonight. I want you to, to grasp the importance of that, that one phrase. What are we talking about? Hot buttons. Jesus does not have any hot buttons when it comes to the devil. Oh, you're one of his hot buttons. You, 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 you enticed him off his throne in heaven. He came here for you. And you and you and you. He came to redeem you. He came to change you. He came to include you. He came to fill you. One day he's going to come take you home. Yeah, because of his love for you. You may be his only hot button, but when it comes to the devil, there are no buttons that can be pushed. Then he concludes the, set, the, the, the conversation at this point, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do arise, <coughs> let us go hence. <coughs> Now, this is the hour of Jesus' trial and suffering. And in verse 28, he's telling them, you guys ought to be glad that I'm going to do this because this is important. This is needed. <clears throat> they're all concerned and they're all just, just troubled. Troubled is the word that he used. Don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. But they were. 
And he told them, verse 28, you, you really ought to be glad because I'm, I'm going to rejoice. Verse 31, Jesus is telling them, all right, not only are you going to know, but the world is going to know that I came from the Father and that I love the Father and that the Father loves me because what's going to be accomplished is wonderful. And, and you're, going to re you're going to understand it after it's all over with. Then he moves on into the part we want to talk about tonight. The prince of this world is coming. Verse 30. You and I understand that the accuser played a major role in the betrayal and the sufferings of Christ. Now I want you to think about this. Sometimes we think a little bit too simply. We think, well you know if something comes from the devil, it's got to be bad. It's got to be terrible if it came from the devil. Well, you know, that's not always true. May I use as exhibit A, the Apostle Paul. Was the Apostle Paul a man of God? You bet you. Was the Apostle Paul an anointed, filled, fruitful servant of the living God? You bet you. He's got a long track record of it. Was he faithful? Buddy, he ran the race all the way through the finish line. He told Timothy that. I fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've run my race. I'm ready to take my laurel on my head and go home. But the Apostle Paul was given all kinds of revelation. Matter of fact, a great portion of the New Testament was revealed to the Apostle Paul alone. And he says in, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, under the inspiration of the, Holy, of the Holy Spirit. He's reporting accurately what took place. Because God gave me so many revelations, God did not want me to get the big head. You know what the big head is? It's when you're swelled up with pride. I love the old saying, every time I think of pride and love, I think of what somebody said one time, how you can tell the difference between love and pride. Of course, according to the scripture, love puffs up. Love, I mean, excuse me, Pride puffs up and love builds up. And they said, how to tell the difference? Stick a pin in it. If it's puffed up, it'll go boom. If it's, if it's a love, they'll just say, ah, that hurts. He said, so that I won't be lifted up with pride. God kept me in what I would describe personally as a, a little bit of a humiliating condition. Now, humiliation has negative consequences, but sometimes it's just kind of neutral. Uh, Paul was humiliated by a serious physical infirmity. What was it? We don't know. But it was called a thorn in the flesh. Now, when under inspiration, the Apostle Paul described the thorn in the flesh what did he describe it as? A messenger of... I want you to stop and think about how wise and how powerful, and I guess if you wanted to attack negative consequences, you could say, and how manipulative God is. I wouldn't attach anything negative to that. What I'm trying to say is God can and does use everything. When Romans 8.28 says God works everything together for your good, if you love God and you're called according to His purpose, you know what that means? It means God uses everything concerted together for your good. So what did God do? He used the devil to be the messenger of a thorn in the flesh in the life of His apostle. Why? doing good. He said, I don't think it was good. It made him weak. And Jesus, right on the coattails of that, said, and in your weakness, my strength is perfected. So what I, my point is, and I better get to it quickly, the evil one is coming. And he is a primary agent in what Jesus is going to suffer. But you say in Isaiah 53, it pleased God to bruise him. It pleased God.
to have him suffer. Why is that? Because his suffering brought about redemption. Because his suffering brought about reconciliation. And so what Jesus is saying to us, my father's going to use the devil to accomplish something. We can see through the rest of the situation, the hardness of the people's hearts, the one that shouted Hosanna, Hosanna said, kill him, kill him, kill him. We know that wasn't the Spirit of God that inspired that. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither can He tempt anybody with evil. When it came time to put His Son to the test and to put His Son in the position of suffering and dying, God recruited the devil. Now the devil thought, hot dog, got him now. I'm going to kill him. And I'll be heir to this world. I'm convinced, the more I read scripture, that the devil actually thought that if he put Jesus to death, that he would win. But Jesus made it plain. He doesn't have anything in me. The devil will do his worst, but the devil will fail because of who Jesus is. You see, in his frail human body, think about being one of those people who observed him suffer. I mean, they just beat him over and over again with that whip. He was ripped and shredded and bled and the thorns and they spat on him and they mocked him. And you, you would think, why are you letting this happen? What's wrong with you? I mean, I, that'd be something to come out of my mouth. What's wrong with you? Well, even Pilate said, there's nothing wrong with him. I find no fault in him at all. But if you were to view this and you would say, this is malicious, this is cruel, this is not a good and godly thing. No, the way it was carried out was not a good and godly way of carrying it out. But Jesus is so, man, I wish I had the words. He's so wonderful. He is so glorious. He is so victorious that by subjecting himself to what the devil was throwing at him, he was doing the greatest act in all of creation's history. Nothing equals, nothing rivals. What Jesus did as the accuser was doing his worst. The devil thought he'd win. Jesus committed himself to the keeping of his Father and won the great victory. Listen, we're going to heaven because he did what he did. We're forgiven because he did what he did. We're changed because he did what he did. We have confidence because he did what he did. But listen, it'll work for us right down here in this world. And this is what I want to get to, and I'll, I'll move into it right now. <clears throat> the, Jesus said, he has got nothing in me. Basically, I'm, I'm using the terminology, he's got no buttons in me to push. Now, don't miss this. This is very important. You might say it this way. Jesus was saying, the devil's coming, the prince of this world is coming, but he has no right and no power over me. I ask you this question, does the devil have right and power over the people of this world? He's called the prince of the power of the air. The word of God says that the whole world lies in the evil one. We're like his lap dog. He usurped authority over the planet when he took it from Adam and Eve. Jesus called him the God, little g, of this world. He has right and power over us. One of the powers he holds over humankind is the fear of death. He hadn't got that over Jesus. Jesus didn't fear death because nobody could take his life from him, you see. And the devil subjected him to torture. But the devil couldn't take his life. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. May I ask you this question, is there any sin in Jesus? Even Pilate recognized that. 
no fault at all. The devil had no grounds to intimidate Jesus. Why? Because he had committed himself entirely to the keeping of his Father. Earlier in his ministry, he said, My food and my drink is to do the will of my Father and to finish his work. I am all about my Father and I am not about anything else. Jesus was in the world but not of the world. Jesus was in the world but he did not love the world. Jesus was in the world but he did not come out of the bondage of worldly things. We are born into the bondage of worldly things because we are born with a sinful nature. And because we have a sinful nature, we choose to sin. When you're given the choice, you're going to make the wrong one left to yourself. Many times people will do it thinking, well, I'm a good person. I have justification for this. And that's just a double, double blindness. Not only are they doing wrong, but they're trying to justify it at the same time. Jesus was not subject to any of that. And so he said, the devil doesn't intimidate me because he's got nothing against me. He has no buttons to push. Now let's think about who Jesus is. John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was who? And the word was? And the word? The same was in the beginning with God. This is God. Whoever the word is, he's God. He's co-equal with the Father, right? Verse 14, and the Word became and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, but the Word was not made sinful flesh. Now, biologically, why is that true? Excuse me? He had no human father. The man, Jesus Christ, was literally conceived by the Holy Ghost. And all that basically was, was taking the son who lived in heaven and brought him into the womb of the woman on earth. You see, he was the same person in heaven, but he came and, and started out as a couple of cells and developed as a small baby that cried and wet diapers and could not speak until somebody taught him to. He went through the process of humanity. But though he went through the processes of humanity, and though he looked exactly like humanity, and wouldn't it be cool to do a DNA test on Jesus? <laughs> wow! The things we could learn. Oh, I'm looking forward. I believe God will publish it one day for us in heaven. You see, he was flesh. But he was not sinful flesh. You and I have human fathers. You can't exist without having a human father. You're, you're not the son of God. Literally, physically, biologically. We are children of God by faith and we are born of the Spirit of God. But Jesus was begotten of the Father. In uh, Romans chapter 3, excuse me, chapter 8, verse 3, it says what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And on the account of sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Do you notice that Jesus did not come in sinful flesh? The scripture is very precise. It's very careful to communicate the absolute truth on this subject. Jesus did not have a sin nature. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He looked like us. He talked like us. He got tired like us. He got hungry and thirsty like us. But he was entirely distinct from us in that he was born with no buttons to push. Let's look at another scripture and then we'll talk about that. In Philippians chapter 2, another wonderful, magnificent declaration of the coming of Christ. We call this the kenosis of Christ. He, he emptied himself to become a man. <clears throat> it says in verse 7 of chapter 2 of Philippians, But he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now understand, Jesus 
could feel pain and Jesus could feel pleasure. Jesus could get hungry and thirsty. Jesus could want a warm blanket when he was cold. Jesus could, uh, would like to have a house to dwell in during the rainy season. He had human, uh, a human vehicle to travel around in. And his human vehicle was subject to the same basic biological needs that every person. Matter, matter of fact, let me just mess with you a minute. Jesus, being an adult man, could recognize that women are beautiful and attractive. He could. He could recognize. Listen to me. Jesus designed and made women beautiful and attractive. He had the capacity in a wholesome and righteous way to experience appetites of the whole gamut of human, the human condition. But he didn't have a sinful nature. What were Adam and Eve like in the garden? A very pitiful and poor representation of this because they made the wrong decision. They went from good to bad. They went from living to dead. But when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they were, as Louis Grizzard would describe as, naked. You know, naked is when you don't have clothes on. Naked is when you don't have clothes on and you're up to something. That's according to Louis Grizzard. Adam and Eve loved one another. They loved one another emotionally. They loved one another. They expressed it physically. Human sexuality didn't come after the fall of man. Human sexuality was built into the people in their innocence the day in which they were born because God said, be fruitful and multiply. He would have told them to do something they weren't capable of doing. But they weren't ashamed. They were husband and wife. They were wholesome feelings that they had for one another. When they got hungry, they ate. When they got thirsty, they drank. And, and all of the desires and cravings of people in a good way that we have, Adam and Eve possessed. The problem is they stepped over the line. They were enticed by the evil one. And they fell for it. And from that point, what did they do? They ran and hid, and they were A-F-R-A-I-D, afraid. They were scared. Have you ever experienced paralyzing fear? These people never experienced fear before. And they ran and hid in the bushes when they heard the voice of God. Why would they be afraid of God? Because they were guilty and ashamed. You see, it's the sin nature that developed in Adam and Eve the moment they chose to sin against God. That's the button in us that the devil pushes. But Jesus Christ was not subject to that. He had normal emotions. He had normal metabolism. He had normal... He had the likeness of flesh, but not sinful. He could suffer as a man. He could be tested as a man. And by that I mean tested in the sense that sometimes it's used in the Scripture when we see the English word tempted. Now God doesn't tempt anybody with evil. But God does test His people. He tested Abraham to take Isaac up the hill. Put him on an altar, kill him and offer him to me. Now God was not going to let him kill his son. But Abraham didn't know that. And so God tested Abraham but God did not tempt Abraham to do evil because He was not going to allow Abraham to do evil. God is not tempted with sin and He doesn't tempt anybody else. Jesus could be tested like any human being. But He had no sin nature. He could perceive both pleasure and pain, but He was more connected to the Father than He was to the world. He was in the world, but the world didn't have a hold on Him. Listen to me, some of you have experienced in your life in Christ moments, maybe even days, when stuff that used to eat your lunch, that used to just own you, doesn't own you now. Certain fears and certain temptations that you just kept falling for and falling for and falling for. But in Christ you have found 
You're not anymore of the world. You don't have to fall for that stuff. Sometimes we get even cocky a little bit because we're so thankful. I'm free at last. I'm free at last. I guess that's why God gave Paul the Apostle this, that thorn in the flesh to keep him so he didn't get too proud, you know. Or get lifted up because pride is one of those things. We have the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the summary of the enticement of the world. Those are the buttons that the devil pushes in us. Jesus had natural desires and cravings, but he didn't have the lust of the flesh. The inordinate desire to experience what the world offers instead of what the Father wants. He didn't have the lust of the eyes, the covetousness. I see it, I, therefore I want it. I must have it. He'd like to have a blanket when he was cold. He'd like to have a roof over his head when it was raining. But it, he did not have an inordinate affection for it. He chose rather to suffer and please the Father than to please himself. And when it comes to the pride of life, if anybody ever had the right to be proud, Jesus was perfect. Jesus pleased the Father. Jesus had authority over sickness and death and the devil. Jesus was never cocky. Jesus was never puffed up. He humbled himself to become a man. And he lived humbly as a servant, not just for three and a half years during his public ministry, but through his entire existence on the earth. He was God's humble servant. And so, pride, the button of pride was not in him. When he did wonderful glory, he said, you know, if I do anything even halfway good, I feel real good about it. Oh, I did something good. I'm so glad. Jesus did nothing but good. He went about doing good. But he didn't react to it the way my flesh wants to. My flesh wants people to notice. And if they don't notice, I say, hey, look, see? See what I did? Don't you have that problem? That's pride. What we should say is, hey, you notice what God did in my life? I couldn't do that. God did that. That's what Jesus did constantly. He said, I'm only saying what the Father's saying. I'm only doing what I see my Father do. I didn't come for my glory. I came to glorify my Father. <clears throat> Here's the wonderful part of this. Jesus being in the likeness of humanity. He was human. He was, he was a man. But not a member of Adam's race. No, no sinful nature. But he could feel the things that we feel. I'm going to give you an application to this in just a moment. But I want you to see this first. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. It's a double negative the way it's written. It says, we do not have a high priest which can't be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. But was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Now a double negative becomes positive. It's just like math. So, when it says we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, what it means is we have a high priest who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. You know what, anybody here have infirmities? You got infirmities? I'm not just talking about a weak voice that a little bit of pollen messes with. I'm not just talking about limbs that, that wear out and backs that wear out. I'm talking about character flaws because we're so the apostle or whoever wrote Hebrews um, said to, to lay aside those sins which do so easily beset us we seem to be hit with that same sin over and over again these are infirmities these are weaknesses these are buttons that the devil pushes Jesus can feel our infirmities yet without ever stepping over the line and sinning. Did you know it's not a sin to be angry? I heard a counselor the other day, a good Christian counselor, and I thought he was on good ground. He said, you know what? When, when your husband is, is just out of line completely, when your wife is out of line completely, you should be angry without sin. 
And you shouldn't keep feeding the fire of it either, you see. It's one thing for a fire to break out. It's another thing for you to pour gasoline on it, you know. The Bible says don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. The only way the sun can go down upon your wrath is because you're keeping the, you keep feeding the fire. We're supposed to forgive in the way that we want to be forgiven. We're supposed to forgive the way God has forgiven us for Christ's sake. And so we are supposed to be offended, at least acknowledge the fact that in some way we are wounded and hurt and diminished. But the Bible says, yet without sin. You see, if someone does something to me that causes me to be angry, I can recognize that that's taken place. But then if I choose to act in a punitive way because I am angry, you know what punitive means? I'm going to hurt them. If I choose to act in a punitive way because I'm angry, I have stepped over the line and I have sinned. Do you reckon Jesus was ever angry? Twice in Scripture it's recorded. Those sorry, greedy folks were in the court of the Gentiles where they're supposed to be reaching the lost. And what are they doing? They're filling their pockets with money. Exchanging money and selling high-priced sheep and goats and whatever for, for temple sacrifice. And he made him a rope, a whip, and he ran those rascals out of there. The Bible doesn't say he hit anyone with the whip. The Bible says he was angry. The Bible says he expressed it in a way that made them leave. But he did not step over the line. He said, my father's house is supposed to be a house of prayer. You made it a den of thieves. He was doing the right thing. I guarantee you, you try to hurt a member of my family, and I will be angry. And I will be angry with prejudice. Now, I need to pray when I get angry with prejudice. That let God let this be righteous indignation. And I should use all means to defend them if I can. But that doesn't mean if they run out the door that I chase after them and shoot them down on the street. You see, there's a big difference there. It's one thing to protect. There's another thing to have malice. And to step over the line. And that is sin. My point, Jesus was angry, but he didn't sin. Jesus did good things, but he wasn't puffed up. Jesus had hunger and thirst, but he never sinned. I imagine he fasted a whole lot more than you and I would ever imagine. We know he spent whole nights in prayer. Jesus can feel what we feel. Fellas, do you notice that as society gets worse and worse, you find yourself looking at the ceiling more and more? when you're in the company of women because they're in varying stages of undress and, and you just say, you know, I don't want to sin with my eyes. Hi, ma'am. How are you? Where are you? Oh, there you go. Okay, hi. I don't go to the beach anymore unless it's empty. I don't go to watch shows where people parade. Nothing wrong with the human body. It's your wife. It's your husband. You see, Jesus never sinned. He had desires, but He never sinned. But He understands what we go through. Hebrews 2.18 <clears throat> For in that He Himself has suffered being tempted, He is able to help them that are tempted. Twice the Bible records that Jesus was severely tested after he fasted 40 days. Then the devil came and enticed him three different ways. He enticed him with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He turned every th all, all of them down. And now he's being tested in his suffering and in his death. And he does not yield. He knows what it's like to be tempted. And so he is able to help those who are tempted. We have a high priest that is able to sympathize with our feebleness. Because in a way, he was feeble like us. He became a man. Splinters stuck in his flesh when he worked with wood. Blisters formed on his feet when he walked mile after mile after mile. 
thirst parched his throat when he didn't have water to drink. He felt our feebleness, yet without sin. How am I going to apply this to you and me, and how are we going to take it home? There is something in us that can be manipulated by the adversary. Jesus had nothing within him that the adversary could manipulate. The devil pushed as many buttons as he could. He couldn't find a button. Not a button. He couldn't hack Jesus at all. But he can hack you and me. Because he's got a resident program within us. Part of our makeup is F-L-E-S-H. And in the New Testament, flesh is not a good word. Whenever you see flesh in the context, it's scary. You find things about death and dying and suffering and condemnation when it comes to fleshly stuff. It's not that the flesh is evil. The body is just a body. But it's that sinful desire, that twisted nature that became twisted in the fall of man. That's the button the devil keeps pushing. And you've sinned, just like I have. But you've also overcome temptation, like I have. We have an unholy trinity working against us. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And our flesh is that resident in us enemy that's in the camp. And the Bible says in Galatians 6, don't be deceived. Don't let anybody fool you. God will not be mocked. You're not going to make fun of God. Because whatever a man sows, that he also reaps. I plant rows of okra. You know it's going to come up. If anything comes up, it'll be okra and weeds. Because the enemy sowed the tares in there with it. You know. Whatever you sow, you're going to pick. You're going to have come up. He says, He that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Now corruption is bad stuff. That's what's in a septic tank. That's what's in your house when the uh, termites and the, the mold and rot invade. That's called corruption. It's what takes nice, good, uh, good quality things and turns them to stuff that you have to throw in the landfill. If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, you shall reap life everlasting. Whatever a person invests in, he will reap a dividend of that nature. If you sow your life into the soil of the flesh, you will reap corruption. Anybody ever notice that? There's a cycle going on in your life. Every time you invest in greed, every time you invest in pride, every time you invest in lust, you always get a return. And you wish you hadn't. But it says if you sow your life into the soil of the Spirit of God, you invest in the things of the Spirit of God, you will reap life everlasting. Let's connect this together. I know in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. But the one exception to that that I can possibly bring up, I don't know that he I don't think he lives in my flesh, but wherever he lives, Christ lives in me. We read this morning, Jesus said, abide in me, and I abide in you. And it makes all the difference in the world. Here's how we overcome temptation. Here's how we overcome the adversary. Jesus won every battle. He never, ever, ever, ever can lose. And that's good. And if He is in you, and He is in me, if I choose to invest in the things of the Spirit, I'll reap life and peace. I choose to invest in the flesh, I will reap corruption. You're going to open your Bible tonight. You're going to open your Bible in the morning. You're going to invest in the things of God. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. You're going to invest in an ongoing conversation with God. You want to pray without ceasing, you've got to start the day praying. I don't know about you, but I'm too feeble-minded. If I don't intentionally close the door, you know, Jesus talked about going in your closet. If I don't have some closet prayer at the beginning of the day, 
I'm not going to have much of a conversation with God the rest of the day. You've got to get that line of communication established. Maybe you fail to do it. You better do it while you're in traffic or else you're going to act in anger and that's going to be sin. Amen? So unto the Spirit. Now, <clears throat> all of the religious <clears throat> exercises that I can do, whether it be Bible reading or praying or giving alms or preaching and witnessing, they're not going to give me victory per se. I have hot buttons in me. And when the devil comes to push my buttons, he can manipulate me and he can con me and he can spook me into doing the wrong thing. But if I put myself into Christ, Christ has no buttons to push. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a brand spanking new critter. He's a new created thing. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The Apostle Paul talked about dying, dying to the flesh, dying to the old man, dying to the world on a regular basis so that the life of Christ might be raised, resurrected, lived out in me. If I'm going to have victory over temptation, when the evil one comes for me, and if I'm going to be in a position that he's got nothing in me, then what I've got to do is I've got to get into Christ. And I have got to make an exchange to get into Christ I have to choose to present my body to Him. I have to choose to present my mind to Him. I have to choose to yield to Him. And when I do, the miracle of transformation takes place. Jesus, who can't be tempted with sin, He was tested, but He can't be enticed because there's no buttons in Him. Jesus takes over. Spiritual warfare is not about me being smart. It's not about me being fast. It's not even about so much me being vigilant. It's about me putting myself in the keeping of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because He's the only one that doesn't have buttons to push. You see what I'm saying? And so when Jesus says to us, the adversary's coming, but He's got nothing in me. You, if you keep yourself in the Beloved, keep yourself in Christ. And that's something you're going to have to learn how to do in prayer. You, know, you need to study it. But basically, you're never going to learn it unless you do it on your knees. That's where you learn to keep, get yourself in the Beloved and keep yourself in the Beloved. When you do, the adversary comes for you. You know what he finds? He's got nothing in you either. Because when you are fully in Christ, Jesus has got his hand up and says, go away. Very simple instruction in the book of James. I'll say this and I'm through. It says simply, submit yourself to God. Then resist the devil. Then he'll flee from you. He'll run from you. Here he comes Walk in the streets of Tombstone. Gunning for you. Loaded, got two six guns, ready to pow, shoot you down. You're standing there on the street, all vulnerable. Say, Lord Jesus, would you come out here, please? Jesus walks up and he stands between you and the devil. The devil flees from you. He runs out of town. Now, I know that's a simple analogy. But you see, it is that simple. When I submit myself to Him, when I say, Lord, yeah, there's something in me that wants to lust. There's something in me that wants to be puffed up with pride. There's something in me that wants to be greedy. But I know where that leads. All three of them lead to the same place. Corruption and death. Lord, best as I know how, I want to submit myself to you. 
then I want to resist that devil so he'll flee from me. Bow with me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll take these precious words that Jesus spoke. That the evil one has nothing in him. Oh Lord God, we want to thank you that we are in Jesus. We are in Jesus. We pray that you'll lead us and teach us and help us to stay in Jesus in everything. Not in greed, not in pride, not in lust, not in our own agenda, but Lord, hungry for you, seeking you. Lord, most of all, surrendered and yielding to you. Lord, we know at the end of the day, somebody's going to rule us. We know at the end of the day, we're going to end up surrendering to somebody. Because we can't run our own, own life. We can't do it. The devil's got buttons to push in us. But Lord, you've showed us that if we surrender to you, we can be free from his devices. And I pray for my brothers and sisters that this might be true for every one of us. That we might flee unto the rock that is higher than I. Because everything that's over my head is under your feet. Let us live in the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray it in his precious and holy name. Amen. God bless you.